Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Matt Krauss, and I'm a research associate at McGill. And today I'm going to talk, uh, the title of my talk is The Surprisingly Complex Neural Effects of Transcranial Electrical Stimulation. And before I get going, I just want to point out that this has all been collaborative work with um, another research associate in our lab, uh, Pedro Vieira. Uh, he's a great guy, awesome collaborator. And, you know, I'm looking forward to actually seeing him in person next year instead of just in a little box. But uh, yeah, so this has been a real team effort. So the question we've been interested in is what, if anything, does TES do to the human brain? And this is kind of the opposite of a problem that people have with uh, TMS, where it's very clear that it's doing something. Here, we have a much weaker electric field that's applied to the, to the brain. And it's, uh, we'd like to know what, if, what is it doing and if it's doing anything at all. So just to sort of give you a cartoon example of what might be going on. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to sort of limit myself to TACS, which is one form of transcranial electrical stimulation that uses uh, sinusoidally alternating current. And so here I have a little cartoon of several theories that might actually that might explain what TACS is doing to the brain. So here we have some spikes. We apply this electric field to the head. We hope that it somehow penetrates into the skull, into the brain, and interacts with these neur this neuron's ongoing activity. And for a while, based on sort of not particularly representative data from like decerebrate cats, people had this idea that it could evoke waves of sort it could evoke and suppress waves of synchronous activity. So here you'd see it sort of adds in these spikes in orange and deletes the spikes that were in. Uh, that have become dashed lines. And that's not at all true. So the, the electric field strength in the brain is orders of magnitude too small to do this, especially once you go through the, the skull and the scalp as you need to do in sort of a human participant. However, um, more recent data uh, from our lab and from Alex's lab has shown that what it can do is it can sort of refine spike times. So it, uh, it takes the ongoing activity and it kind of applies a small nudge that pushes action potentials uh, towards or away certain phases of it so that the cells fire in sync with the external electric field and sort of by extension with each other. So in the first part of my talk, I'm gonna show you some data from non-human primates that, that uh, sort of demonstrates this in a, what we think is a very realistic model system. And then the second part of the talk, I'll show you that this actually only happens sometimes. And once you start interacting with uh, physiological oscillations, uh, things get weird and it's, I think, both a, a big challenge for us going forwards and also an opportunity to do some neat things that people haven't really thought about. So, uh, why do we work with macaques? So here I'm gonna show you two pictures on the left, uh, one of me and one of a monkey. And you might be able to see that there's sort of a, a fairly strong similarity. In particular, in particular, we both have big heads. Inside the heads, there are thick bony skulls. Uh, and inside the skulls, there are large gyrated brains. The functional organization of our brains is fairly similar and it supports complex behavior, often visually guided. And these similarities persist all the way from the gross anatomical levels and behavioral levels down to the sort of microstructure so uh, macaques and humans both have fairly sparse synaptic connectivity as compared with uh, rodents and other models. So all these factors may affect how things, uh, how TES affects a brain, uh, but the major advantage of the macaque is that it's suitable for large scale sort of exploratory electrophysiology. Uh, so we do a mix of acute recordings uh, with these linear electrodes that we insert at the beginning of each experiment and chronic recordings with permanently implanted Utah rays. So from each of these, these sites, uh, we record a wideband signal that we can extract local field potentials, um, which I've shown here in yellow, and individual you know, single unit activity, uh, which I've shown here in blue. So uh, at the same time, we can stimulate just like we do in a human, right? So we apply stimulation directly to the animal's scalp, uh, to the intact scalp, not on the bone or directly into the brain. Uh, the animal's awake, it's behaving, um, doing some of the complex behaviors. And just to sort of reassure you about the the fidelity of the model, I'm gonna briefly talk about, all right, so the electric fields produced during TES um, in macaques and, and humans are fairly similar. So there's gonna be a lot about this over the next two days, but in brief, if you're armed with sort of information about the anatomical structure uh, of an animal, so it's, you know, what's skin, what's bone, what's CSF, white matter, gray matter, um, and any things you sort of added to the brain like an implant, and you know its electrical properties, you can predict the electric fields that arise in the brain from uh, from stimulating at certain locations. And this is good because in healthy human subjects, obviously you can't measure them directly, uh, but there's been a sort of surprising convergence that electric fields in a, in a healthy human brain are on the order of one volt per meter, often a little bit less. So here on the left, I've got uh, pulled four papers from the literature. And this is, I think, a pretty consistent finding. Uh, it's also been measured a few times, both in cadavers and in living human neurosurgical patients, and it's smack in that range. So on the right, I've put data from uh, our three monkeys, that have, our four monkeys that have participated in these projects. And you can see that the electric fields that we've predicted this, with this method and also the electric fields that we've measured are bang on. So we're getting data that looks just like uh, 
or we're exposing the animals to electric fields that look just like what you'd expect to get in a human being. So armed with that, we can look to see what single units are doing. And to do that, we use a fairly straightforward experimental design. So the monkeys and in all of these experiments is sitting uh, in, a, in a chamber doing this sort of cover fixation task. He looks at the dot on the screen, and as long as he keeps his eyes near the dot for a few seconds, he gets a liquid reward. And the point of this is to just keep him in a consistent motivational state. We want him awake, we want him motivated. We also don't want him expecting rewards, so they're delivered with sort of a, a exponential jitter that keeps him from in, sort of entraining or expecting reward at any given time. And while he does that, we apply blocks of either real TACS or uh, sham stimulation. So in real TACS, we just continue applying a, a sinusoid to the scalp for either a minute and a half or five minutes with these little ramp up and ramp down periods at the end. And we compare that against sham stimulation where we include the ramps at the beginning and the end because these elicit sort of a somatosensory percept. Uh, so the uh, human and animal participants both tend to jolt when it comes on. And uh, you know, again, we wanna keep everything in, as consistent as possible. So what we do is we do that, but then we record in the middle uh, in this flat. So in one condition, we're applying current to the scalp. In the other condition, uh, there's no current being passed. And we think this is as close as you can get to sort of a like for like. So we do blocks of stimulation, blocks of sham, uh, randomly interleaved for basically as long as we can get the animal to work. And we vary the parameters. So the first set of data I'm gonna show you comes from uh, two recording sites in the deep brain. Uh, one is in the hippocampus uh, shown here on the left and these are, and in the basal ganglia on the right. So these are uh, MRI, combined MRI CTs of the both animals. So you can see that's, that's exactly where we recorded. Um, and we can collect sort of, uh, yeah, sorry. So before I show you the population data, I just wanna give you a sense for what our data looks like. Uh, so here's data from an individual basal ganglia neuron. So these are t uh, a dozen one second sweeps uh, while the animal's doing that fixation task. And we can sum up the total number of spikes. And since we're also recording the LFP, we can we also record the LFP. We can look at when the spikes occur relative to the local field potential. So here we get about 10 spikes per second. And these spikes are distributed uh, fairly evenly across all the different phases of the local field potential. Next, we flip on the stimulator. Uh, so in the example I'm showing you here, it's 20 Hertz TACS. And uh, you can see that things change uh, fairly dramatically for this neuron when the stimulation comes on. So the overall number of spikes remains pretty much constant. It decreases a little bit, but not significantly. Uh, but the timing of these spikes is very, very different. Um, so you can see that they're aligned with this, this sort of preferred phase very, very nicely um, during the TACS condition, but not the sham condition. And we quantify this using, uh, well, I'm gonna show you the quantification using par uh, phase locking values or PLVs. So these are um, under some simplifying assumptions, pretty much the same as spike field coherence. And the way we actually compute it is we do pairwise phase consistency, which has a little bit uh, better statistical properties. And then I've just converted it back to this because it's more commonly used and I think easier to wrap your head around. So for this neuron, uh, during the sham stimulation, the PLV is effectively zero. And once the stimulation kicks on, it jumps up to 0.73. So PLV ranges from zero to one, and you, know, you can see that it's actually very, very nicely entrained here. So this is uh, one of the best cells. So I'm gonna show you two more. Uh, so these were recorded on adjacent channels uh, at the same time. And one neuron shows a sort of dramatic, uh, moderate increase in entrainment, uh, no change in firing rate. And the other neuron basically is completely unaffected, even though these are about 150 microns apart. So the top neuron is particularly important because this is sort of the average neuron. Uh, it works out to be the median in, in many different respects um, and we, you'll be seeing it a few times. So just take a, a quick glance while it's still there. Okay, so we do this, we collect hundreds of neurons uh, from, from the electrodes and I'm gonna summarize the results of those experiments using these scatter plots. So along the horizontal axis, we'll have uh, some quantity that occurs during the sham stimulation. Here I plotted the firing rate. And on the vertical axis, I plotted the same quantity uh, during, during the stimulation. Uh, cells showing a sort of individually significant change. I'm, I'm gonna shade, uh, they're, they're in different colors depending on what's going on with different shapes denoting different areas. So for firing rate, there is no, we have not found a significant difference in any frequency, in any area, in any condition. So this is the last time I'm gonna talk about it. So we have tested, uh, however, for entrainment, uh, we see something rather different. So here I'm applying the phase locking value during sham versus the phase locking value during TACS. And you can see that for most, uh, for 33% of the neurons, there's a significant increase in, in phase locking. And sometimes it's quite dramatic. Uh, there's that diamond up in the upper left corner. And other times it's, it's fairly small. Uh, this is to five Hertz. Uh, we see similar patterns at five, 10, 20, and 40 Hertz, which are all the conditions we've tested. Um, all of them increase uh, this sort of overall magnitude of phase locking 
is the same at all, at all these frequencies and across both the areas we recorded from. Um, oh, sorry. And at the top, I've shown the proportion in, in red. I've shown the proportion of neurons that show a significant effect. And, you know, it's sort of... Uh, so it ranges from about a third to about two thirds. So uh, this, is, this is pretty cool. Uh, there are a couple of possible explanations. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So again, to go back, this is the, uh, the median neuron that I showed you earlier, and it would be right in the middle of this, uh, this 20 hertz this blob here, right? So even the median effect is, is fairly substantial and might be useful for something. <laughs> so one question that, that sort of plagued the transcranial electrical field is concerns over whether we're actually stimulating the brain. So the electric field reaching the brain is quite weak. Uh, there's a fairly strong field, however, in the skin, which could be driving peripheral afferents or cranial nerves. Because the eyeballs are fairly conductive, it can also drive uh, retinal afferents. Um, and a common side effect of TACS is to induce phosphines. So you could imagine that all of these provide sort of off-target sources of entrainment. They could give us a neural effect, uh, but maybe one that's harder to harness. So we've done a couple of control experiments to rule this out. Uh, the first is just simply to move the electrodes. So in this experiment, uh, this actually before I start here, this would be a good time to point out that the effects we see are uh, frequencies selective. So when we stimulate at 10 hertz, uh, which is in the top left, we see uh, an increase in phase locking value versus the sham at exactly 10 hertz. When we stimulate at 20 hertz, uh, that bump shifts over to 20 hertz, and there's no other entrainment uh, to any frequency that we've tested, at least out to 100 hertz. So in this first control experiment, we, uh, we'd like to rule out the effects of cranial nerves and possibly the retina, and we just do it by simply shifting the stimulating electrode to the opposite hemisphere. So uh, our recording chamber here is on the left. We uh, when we stimulate with a montage that's, that's, tar that's designed to target that area, we see this increase. When we flip it to the contralateral hemisphere, uh, the effect is completely abolished, right? So I put a little triangle here. Um, so at 10 hertz, the 10 hertz bump is gone. At 20 hertz, the 20 hertz bump is gone. Um, so we think that this, this helps for cranial nerves because the skin is fairly conductive. Uh, there's cranial nerves everywhere. And it should be fairly insensitive to the precise position of the electrodes. These same data also suggest that retinal stimulation is not a huge driver of this effect. Uh, so here I've modeled the electric field on the monkey's uh, skin, and there's a strong, uh, sort of almost strong enough to elicit action potential field in the, in the eyeballs. Uh, but because of the nature of the visual system, stimulation of, so this stimulation hits both hemispheres, um, right? The nasal part of the visual field projects one way, the temporal part projects the other way. Uh, so if there were sort of phosphine evoked activity that's sort of percolating through the brain, uh, we'd expect it to be similar in both conditions, but uh, as we see the effects on entrainment here, we don't, uh, we don't see any effects on entrainment. Another possibility is that we're driving afferents in the skin. Uh, so it, applying TACS produces sort of a tingling sensation uh, in the skull or scalp. Uh, sorry, not in the scalp. In the scalp. Uh, and one way to block that is with a topical anesthetic. So we repeated the same experiment um, only at 20 hertz this time using a topical anesthetic, uh, Emla cream. It's commonly used in tattoo parlors. And now I got a lot of very weird emails from vendors, uh, but it effectively blocks stimulation in humans. Uh, we tried it on me and we have a brief behavioral readout from the monkey that I'm not gonna show, showing that it blocks his sensation of the stimulation as well. So we just repeated the experiment I showed earlier uh, with one sort of outer condition. On some days we pre-treated the skin with a topical anesthetic for an hour. We really let it soak in there. Um, numb the skin up, and then we frantically recorded for an hour to get data while the anesthetic was still at, at full strength. On other days, we just had the monkey sit in the lab for an hour and then repeated the same sort of rush. So we have data from, so uh, when we do this, we find no significant change in the amount of entrainment or the percent of neurons entrained. Uh, uh, sorry, let me back up here. What we see is we see in both conditions, we see a dramatic inc increase in the phase locking values during TACS versus sham. Uh, the the proportion of neurons in both, that are entrained in both conditions is, the, is not significantly different. Neither is the sort of median entrainment strength. So if you compare uh, the data in yellow, which is collected without the topical anesthetic with data in green, the medians are the same, the proportions are the same. And we sort of stole a page from drug development and used what's called an equivalence test, which lets us ask sort of a combination question of, is there more than a 20% difference between these conditions? And if so, do we have the powers to detect it? Uh, the statistical power to detect it. The answer to that is, no, there's not a significant difference, but if there were, we could detect it to within those bounds. So this is uh, really exciting, right? So uh, it's sort of good news if you're applying human experiments, which we've been, which we'd like to do. Um, 
So we published the stuff, people cited it, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but we've also sort of begun to realize that it's a little bit different from what human uh, TES users, sort of cognitive neuroscientists and clinicians are actually doing. So if you dig into the literature, uh, so I just, these are actually the quotes from some of the first three papers I found on PubMed using TACS and human subjects. And you can see that uh, the first paper writes, uh, alpha TACS could therefore be used to increase endogenous alpha amplitude. Others say experimentally increased, transiently reinstore. So you find lots of words about reinstore, reinstate, increase, boost. Um, but when we looked at what we've actually done, we're starting from conditions uh, in the previous experiments, we were starting from conditions where the electrical stimulation or the physiological oscillation is very, very weak to begin with. So uh, phase locking value ranges from zero to one. And here's a scatter plot of the phase locking value of every single cell we've recorded in the hippocampus and basal ganglia. And they are clustered really, really close to zero. So to sort of model increasing an, uh, an actual oscillation, we want something that's got a little bit more, uh, a little bit more oomph, right? We want to be somewhere towards the center of this, this graph, um, something like this. So it turns out that uh, in area V4, TEO, and a lot of the primate visual system, there's a persistent uh, four to six hertz oscillation. Uh, this is a nice paper um, from Pascal Fries's group reporting this. It's all over on um, V1, V2, V4, TEO. Um, and so I've just extracted two of the spectrograms from the paper. So on the, the left here is uh, the raw um, ECOG signal, uh, the power spectrum of the raw ECOG signal. And you can see that there's this, this blip and it's enhanced when the monkey doesn't pay attention. And on the right, it's the same thing, just they've subtracted the one over F background. So this is a, actually looks like a really nice test bed because uh, it's an effect that's cognitively controlled, right? So they can modulate it by having the monkey attend in or attend out of the receptive field. Um, and it's the sort of thing that you could imagine a human experimenter might want to sort of turn one condition into the other. So uh, we just, we decided to sort of repeat these experiments, but in area V4, which is a, um, and at the, the same frequency. So it's same experimental design um, as before, but we found a surprisingly different effect. So first, uh, so here's the V4 data, the V4 five Hertz data um, at one volt per meter. And you can see that, first of all, two things. So if you just look at the distribution of the points along the, the horizontal axis, you can see that now we have this sort of very wide spread there are a bunch of neurons clumped near zero, but there are also neurons out to about 0.4 uh, PLV. And interestingly, when we apply the stimulation, uh, we see this sort of different effect. So in some cases, as before, the neurons show a significant increase in phase locking value to the, TAC to the TACS. In other cases, however, TACS appears to desynchronize neurons. And these sort of, sort of extreme cases, it can push what would be a fairly strongly synchronized neuron all the way to zero. So as a neurophysiologist faced with a some do, some don't situation, uh, we thought that perhaps this reflects a difference between excitatory and inhibitory cells. So to test that idea, we clustered them based on the, the width of the extracellular action potential. Uh, this is a proxy. It's not a perfect one, but it's often reasonably good. So here I've shaded all of the neurons with thin action potentials, which those correspond to putative interneurons purple, and all those with broad spiking activity uh, green. And we see that 75% of the thin spiking neurons fall above this unity line. That is, their phase locking value is increased by TACS. Whereas 75% of, or 73% of the broad spiking neurons are below the unity line. So this suggests that narrow spiking neurons are becoming entrained, broad spiking neurons are being desynchronized. And this is surprising for several reasons. So broad spiking neurons are thought to be particularly susceptible uh, to the external electric fields because they have this sort of long uh, elongated structure that makes them a good candidate for polarization. Inner neurons, however, are sort of morphologically unsuited to being entrained by uh, extracellular electric fields. Uh, they have sort of a bushy, sort of small process so that the polarization tends to cancel. Uh, they also have sort of different input-output relationship. So small depolarizations of pyramidal cells result in small changes in firing rate. Um, inner neurons have a steeper eventual relationship, so a big depolarization produces an even bigger one, but they have a fairly, but they have an offset. So a small depolarization of an inner neuron often causes nothing at all. So this is pretty wild. Um, so we've got desynchronization. Uh, we have sort of uh, transient changes in excit excitatory inhibitory balance. Uh, but we thought also that there might be something a little bit more going on here. And to, to probe that, I'm going to show you the same data plotted in a slightly different way. So we take these polar axes and 
in one dimension, sort of the eccentricity, we plot the phase locking value of a neuron during, uh, let's say, the sham, sham condition. And we plot the phase to which a neuron has become entrained as, as the radial angle. Right? So I'm going to show you two neurons here. The red neuron is weakly entrained uh, to, to the LFP. And you know, it doesn't really matter what its phase is. It's, they're all going to be clustered towards the center. This blue neuron, however, is strongly entrained to the local field potential. Its PLV is 0.4. And it prefers to, to fire just after the trough of the, of the local field potential. We can then ask what happens when we turn on the stimulation by drawing sort of a vector between the old condition and the new condition. So for the, the neuron near the center, uh, its phase locking increases. Uh, so it goes from not entrained at all to entrained moderately strongly and with a preference towards 90 degrees. Uh, the blue neuron, however, starts from being strongly entrained and ends up close to the origin. So these plots get cluttered. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna split the neurons up in three ways. Uh, and I'm gonna start by showing you the neurons that we sort of written off in our previous work as no significant change. Or, and what you meant by that is there's no significant change in PLV. Um, I think the Obitz lab has recorded a bunch of these as well. Uh, I should mention that they've, they have a very similar finding of uh, you know, entrainment by TACS and about this magnitude. So we write no significant change. I think the Opitz lab called them non-responders. But it turns out that these neurons are actually doing something fairly interesting. Some of them don't change in the sort of overall magnitude of entrainment, but the phase to which they have become entrained uh, switches dramatically. So I picked out one of the best examples shown here. So the inset polar plot shows you the phase at which the neuron fires. And it's, it's flipped almost completely from about 225 degrees to just before 90. So these have been written off. And you know, I think we've thought a lot about which neurons are entrained. It turns out that there's lots more going on. And you know, depending on sort of which theory of long range communication you subscribe to, this could have substantial effects on downstream behaviors. So uh, Ole Jensen, for example, has a model where the phase of, of spiking sort of buckets things into different bins. And this would cause a huge alternation in that. OK, so in the next step, uh, so in the next panel, I'm going to show you neurons that showed an increase in PLV. That is, the vector got longer. These neurons largely start towards the origin, and they move towards the extrema. So they either end up at pointing towards 90 degrees or 270 degrees. And these correspond largely to the putative interneurons on the basis of their spike width. Neurons that show a decrease in phase locking value, however, exhibit a different pattern. So they start out clustered near 225 degrees, um, almost all of them. They move towards the origin, and these correspond, we think, to the putative uh, principal cells. However, if you so it would be cool if this represented a sort of a functional distinction between the classes. However, if you look at the uh, some of the data shown here, you can see that maybe there's sort of a two-step process going on. So this neuron all the way on the bottom left of the of the left-hand plot starts near 225. It shoots up, it shoots up towards the origin, and then it goes past it. So we thought that maybe this actually just represents the neurons just sort of Rather than, yeah, sorry. So instead of representing a, sort of a property intrinsic to interneurons or pyramidal cells, it reflects what those particular cell types happen to be doing in our data. So to test this, we tried a couple of things. So the first is just increasing the stimulation amplitude. So if it is sort of sweeping out a trajectory towards, uh, uh, you'd expect that to, to move along that trajectory as the stimulation current increases. And that's exactly what happens. So here I'm showing you. Uh, Four neurons tested at three amplitudes. So the open circle corresponds to the sham. Uh, one of these starts at the origin. The rest are near 225 degrees. Uh, the first closed circle is at plus or minus one milliamp. Uh, so that's about half a volt per meter. And the larger circle corresponds to two millivolts, uh, which for this particular setup corresponds to about one volt per meter. And you can see, finally, uh, we know from sort of the underlying biophysics that these neurons should eventually start becoming uh, entrained or firing at 90 degrees, right? If you increase the field strength to infinity, that's where you'll end up. Um, and so each of these neurons sort of sweeps out that trajectory. Another sort of line of evidence for a, a sort of role-based rather than class-based distinction comes from looking at our old data. So the distribution of interneurons and pyramidal cells is very different in the hippocampus and basal ganglia versus cortex. and we found no effect of actual potential width in this data. But if you squint at it, you can see that there are a few sort of ectopic, let's call them cells, that show a strong entrainment during sham. And these are uniformly decreased by, uh, by applying TACS. So they become desynchronized. Finally, um, we can look at the same 
uh, we looked at the same area. So we, we here I'm comparing 5 hertz TACS's effect on neurons to 20 hertz TACS's effect on neurons. So it's the same area, same paradigm, same electrode, same monkey. Um, some of these are on the same day, and I think we even have a few neurons where it's the same. At 5 hertz, you see the desynchronization. At 20 hertz, there's absolutely no change. Uh, so there are neurons clustered near the origin uh, that, that don't respond, but there are no neurons sort of anywhere past the past about 0.1 PLV. At 20 hertz, these neurons are strongly, um, but they're all entrained. Whereas on the left, uh, the neurons start all over the horizontal axis. Some become entrained, some become de-entrained. So uh, we think this is cool uh, and has some potentially interesting implications for how people use TACS in a variety of, of human paradigms. So to summarize, we find that with sort of open loop TACS at intensities that are achievable in humans in a model system that closely matches humans, uh, two things happen. Neurons that have sort of quiescent or arrhythmic patterns of activity can readily be entrained by TACS, in both cortical and subcortical structures, and in ways that look pretty consistent with a direct effect on them, or at least a local network effect. On the other hand, introducing physiological oscillations uh, makes things a bit more challenging, but also provides sort of an interesting opportunity. So we see bidirectional modulation of entrainment. Um, this does correspond in our data to, to cell types, uh, so potentially offers the possibility of controlling EI balance. Uh, but I think it's related to the role of these neurons in this particular monkey, in this particular brain region, paradigm, et cetera, rather than the intrinsic properties of these cells. Finally, uh, the fact that we see this sort of progression between desynchronous and then eventually synchronous activity is, is also interesting. And we think maybe it could account for some of the subject to subject variability people see in human behavioral studies, right? So you could imagine that if you are particularly unlucky, some of your subjects will be on one side of that knee, other subjects will be on the others. So uh, yeah, we're, we're running this down, and, but uh, the brain is hard. Uh, I think this is gonna be a resounding theme of the day. And I think this sort of emphasizes the need to understand and model not only the effects of the electrical stimulation itself, but what you expect the brain to be doing beforehand and what eventual state you'd like to end up in. So with that, I want to thank my, my team here. So we have a great little uh, TES research group. Uh, we've got a couple of students, uh, Gavin, Luke, and Tudor. Uh, Gavin and Luke are off to grad school. Uh, Tudor just joined. Uh, collab external collaborators, uh, Abi at Soterix and Praveen Pili, who's at HRL. Um, Bennett Sorbo is a grad student in the lab and helped with some TDCS stuff that I didn't show, as well as some of the early TACS stuff. And Pedro, again, and I have been working side by side as much as the present situation allows. And this has all been done in Chris Pack's lab at the Neuro. And I, I really appreciate Chris letting us go on this sort of wild adventure. We are nominally a vision research lab, so this has been a big shift, but it's been really fun. And all this has been supported by DARPA, uh, CIHR, and some recent support from Parkinson's Canada, which I, I very much appreciate. And finally, I would just like to, you know, my email address is in the top right corner, and we'd love to hear from you. So if you have questions, comments, concerns, uh, that would be great. And if there's anything we and our monkeys can do to help you get your TACS or TCS, TES project off the ground, uh, I would love to chat, whether it's like a five-minute Zoom or some long multi-center, uh, you know, giant grant. So thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Very, very exciting new data. Just, um, I have a quick question, actually. Uh, so from your newest re results in V4, um, I mean, obviously we cannot stimulate cell-specific, um, you know, cell-specific resolution. So on the network level, you, do you think that your data alludes a uh, possible nonlinear effect of stimulation intensity, like yes. the lower intensity, there are a mix of effects and then high. Um... So Hannah Filmer has an interesting paper where they report this sort of weird non-monotonic relationship where one milliamp stimulation in a pretty big cohort actually leads to a behavioral improvement that is better than either 0.5 or two milliamps. And I will confess that I sort of rolled my eyes when I first saw this because it seems really weird uh, but looking at our data, like that's, a, it seems like it's a distinct possibility that things are not as linear as they seem. And I think a lot of people, including us, have assumed that, you know, the field strength is linear in the current, but the effects on the neuron are not linear in the field strength. So 
Yeah, the brain is a nightmare. But it's a fun nightmare. Thank you. Right. Great. Great. Maybe you also can just jump in. Um, right. You you also see some like entrainment to different phases. So it's also something we see in our own data that not necessarily all neurons respond preferentially to, to the peak of the oscillation, but they have different preferred phases or somewhat changes. And there's all trying to understand that um, better. Yeah. Why do you think, why do neurons, why do some neurons have diff other preferred phases of, of entrainment? So I think there are two things going on that are very annoying to tease apart in monkeys. So one, maybe three things actually. So one is the orientation of the neurons relative to the field. Um, so in the hippocampus is actually nice in that they are fairly ordered, but basal ganglia is a nightmare. It just looks like a plate of spaghetti. And in cortex, it's very easy to sort of pass through. Um, you know, you're probably not at the same angle as the field. And you can also sort of pass through a sulcus where you get these sort of zebra stripes on the surface of the cortex. So I think it could be, some, some of it could be that. Some of it could be the relationship between the LFP. So the LFP is really not what you want to measure, right? The thing that really matters is the intracellular membrane potential. Um, the LFP is the bulk combination of all these transsynaptic currents way around the electrode. And some of that is probably related to the neuron understudies VM, but you've got all this other contamination. Of course, you can't patch in a monkey. So this is like the best we'll ever do unless you want to spend 10 years per cell. Uh, but some of it is just the signal we're getting is not the signal we really want. And then, yeah, so on top of that, so the neurons getting inputs at different phases. So actually this sort of 225 thing seems to be a fairly common motif in sort of idle cortical areas. Um, so it's related to, so uh, Rodolfo Romo has a paper showing that there's sort of bursts around there that are correlated with inhibition uh, when the monkey's not doing anything. So one of the things that I think would be very cool is to, is to have the monkey do some stuff and then compare these results. But as you know, getting the monkeys to do interesting behaviors is, is a slog. 